From Luke 2, 8 through 16, will you please stand for the reading of God's word? And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. You may be seated. I don't know about you, but that, uh, that's one of my favorite parts. Sit down. <laughs> favorite parts of the story. <laughs> I mean, just imagine what it's like. All right, you can do it. There we go. Good job, Connor. <laughs> one of my favorite parts of the story. You can just imagine what it was like. I mean, shepherds washing their socks by night. Or were they watching their flocks? I mean, well, maybe they did both. Do shepherds have socks? I, I, I guess they would wash them if they did have You guys remember that, right, when you were younger? That's how we sang that Christmas carol. While shepherds watched their socks by night, all seated on... Okay, anyway, it was a lazy, casual night, and all of a sudden, history was changed forever with the appearance of an angel announcing the birth of the Savior, Jesus Christ. And then a multitude of the angels were there. After that, I don't think they were worried about watching flocks or, or washing socks or anything else. I mean, it was the best news that they had ever heard, what they had been waiting for, the Messiah, the Lord. Every Jew knew that the Messiah was to come. And the shepherds were telling them that he was here. And they were so excited. They were so excited that they, that they ran off to Bethlehem to see this new Messiah. Regardless of what the world does today with regard to Christmas, it is still the most celebrated holiday in the world. I mean, it's even bigger than Super Bowl Sunday. Right? Well, for some people, anyway. Right? It is the most celebrated holiday in the world. And regardless of what people think in the world today, something incredible happened that night which changed history forever. The plan for God's salvation for his world, the chance at, um, at eternal life was made available to every one of God's children on that night, starting in that stable in Bethlehem. Well, I would encourage you, since our theme today is joy, to make sure that you add some rejoicing and some joy to your Christmas holidays. I mean, I... I, I I was talking with someone the other day, and Christmas season is hard sometimes for a variety of reasons, but for this person, it's, it's so busy. There are so many things to do. There are so many activities, and there are so many that, just things that demand our time that if you aren't careful and you don't plan for it, you can lose all of your joy as we head toward the most joyous celebration that, that we're ever supposed to celebrate, Right? I mean, Jesus is come. Jesus is born. That's a reason for celebration. So I encourage you to make sure that you put some joy into your celebration, your Christmas celebration. Okay, Pastor, I hear you. It's Christmas time, and we're supposed to add joy. How do I do it? I mean, I know that joy is important. I, I need it. I long for it. I want it. Life is so much better when I have joy in my life. And when I don't have joy in my life, life is, well, you know. I mean, there's enough Scrooges in the world already. We don't need one more. So how do I find joy? How do I live in joy? How do, how do I exist in joy? How do I let that joy that God provides for us flow in my life, not just at Christmas time and, and not just when something incredible happens in my life and I'm happy for a few moments? How do I get and live and keep joy. 
Well, I have some suggestions today. We're going to move and be a little bit more practical today. So I'm going to ask you some questions, and if you're following with your notes, we're going to check some things off. So there are some ways of getting and being and remaining a joyful Christian. The first is this. Check your temperament. Check your temperament. Do you, do you know what I mean by temperament? Did you know that there are four major temperaments or personality traits that are embedded into each one of us? Stick with me for a couple of minutes. It's, uh, do you know what they are? Sanguine, cleric, phlegmatic, and melancholy. In other words, there's Tigger and Rabbit and Pooh and Eeyore. Did you know that, that these temperaments are built into every one of us in varying degrees? And I love the Hundred Acre Woods and Pooh and his friends because these are very clear definitions of a certain kind of temperament, personality temperament. I mean, everyone knows Tigger, right? He's off the chart all the time. Balancing, happy, joyful, that's Tigger. Then you've got Rabbit, who's the choleric. Rabbit is the one who's in charge. Pooh's the one who holds it together, but Rabbit is the one who takes charge whenever there's an issue, whenever there's something needs to happen. He's the type A personality who gets in there and, and takes care of it. Pooh is laid back, phlegmatic. He just kind of holds everything together, and he's not too worried. He doesn't swing too far this way or that way emotionally. And then, of course, you've got Eeyore, the melancholy. He's the one who the rain cloud follows around all the time. He's the one who says, if things, they said, cheer up, things could be worse. And so I cheered up, and sure enough, things got worse. Right? We all have those, these temperaments in varying degrees inside of us. They make a difference how we process life and respond to it. But, but listen to me. God does not intend for just tiggers to be joyful. Did you know that God wants Eeyores to be joyful as well? And don't worry too much if, if, if you don't have the temperament that you like. Because see, here's the, the, the cool part about it. God is in the transformation business. So accept what you are. Use it. Embrace it. Because we need every one of these temperaments. I mean, what would life be like if everyone was a tigger? This would be chaos. What would happen if everyone was an Eeyore? Oh, no. Or a poo or a rabbit. We need all of the temperaments. God created them into, inside of us, but he is in the business to transform any parts of us that need transformation. Did you know that God is in the transformation business? Anything in your life. No, anything that needs transformation is transformable. Here's the passage. I'm just going to put the verses up there in case you want to write them down, but I'm going to read them for you. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Did you catch what it says? How to find joy in your temperaments? Offer yourself as a living sacrifice. All of what you have, the good, the bad, and the ugly, offer it to God willingly. Don't conform to society's idea of the way things should work. Isn't it amazing how often we get caught up in, in what society says is right? How ridiculous is that? And the last is allow God to renew your mind. Allow God to renew your mind. That's the next check. It shows us how to renew the mind part. It's here. Check your attitude. Did you know that attitude is a choice? I mean, did you really know that attitude is a choice? You may have been born with a certain temperament, but your attitude is all you. You choose your attitude. Now, I don't care about your circumstances. Now stay with me. I care about you, and I care about the things you go through in your life. But listen, your circumstances don't define you unless you let them. How often do we make excuses because of stuff? Well, you just haven't had the week that I've had, or, or you don't know the kind of life that I have to deal with, or, or you don't know what happened to me, or you don't know the hand that I've been dealt your circumstances don't define you. You do. You do. <laughs> You've heard it before. If life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Life is tough. 
but God is tougher. Life is hard. Um, which, whichever life is tough or quote you choose, your attitude is what you choose it to be. The great philosopher John Wayne. Here's what the word says from Philippians chapter 2. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, and being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God highly exalted him to the highest place. Um, and gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I've told my children over and over and over again in life, we can choose to act rather than react. That sounds very simple, but it's absolutely true. We choose our attitude. If you'll check your attitude, it'll help with your joy. Number three this morning, check your company. <laughs> There's a story of this very conscientious wife who was trying to please her ultra-critical husband. Every day she would get up and she would make eggs. If she scrambled the eggs, he wanted them poached. If she poached the eggs, he wanted them scrambled. One day she had a great idea. So she scrambled one egg and she poached the other. And she placed the plate before her husband, expecting his approval. And what did he say? Good grief, woman, you poached the wrong one. <laughs> Your company really makes a difference. Let me ask a question. When you have conversations with people, is the focus on roast or is it on blessing? I shouldn't say roast when we're getting close to lunchtime, should I? But you know what I mean. Check your conversations when you go out with certain people. I mean, if they're family, folks, you're stuck with family. You made that choice, and you know, we love family, and, and, and we deal with things there. But there, in a lot of situations, we have a choice who we hang out with. I know a couple um, who every time they went out to eat with this other couple from the church, not necessarily our church, of course, but they would have roast pastor and roast music pastor and roast Sunday school teacher and roast everything. Instead of lunch, it got to be where it was so toxic, they couldn't hang out with those people anymore. So you need to check your company. Who you hang out with affects you far more than you, you, want to, than you can believe sometimes. There's a book out there, uh, it's called Fill Your Bucket. Anyone familiar with that? The concept of it is this, and the reason I'm, I'm familiar with it recently is Michaela had me, they make a children's version and she wanted it for her second graders. Um, Michaela, my daughter. But the idea of it is every person you meet, every connection you have, every relationship does one of two things. It either puts into your bucket or it takes out of your bucket. Think about it. It's kind of, uh, well, makes us evaluate our own self too. When I have conversations with people, am I filling their bucket or am I taking out of their bucket? And listen to me, if the only people that you hang out with take out of your bucket, then you're in trouble. And it will steal your joy faster than anything. I'm, make sure that some of your company, I, I know we always have to deal with some people who will take out of a bucket, and I know there are people who will do that from time to time, but you know what I'm talking about, the people who are constantly a drain on your emotions. Make sure that you spend time with people who fill your bucket. That will help your joy. What does the word say? As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. From Proverbs. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. 
And one more, keep reminding them of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present to yourself to God as one approved, a, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Your company really makes a difference in your joy. You guys, I haven't said this in a while, but you know exactly the answer. The lady who went to the doctor and said, Doctor, doctor, I broke my arm in two places. And the doctor said, Stay out of them places. Folks, we can get into a lot of trouble by being in places that we shouldn't be. Right? Stay out of them places. This next one may not be one you would expect, but it's very important. Check your computer. Now, I really shouldn't need to spend a lot of time on this one today, but any kind of media, TV, computer, texting, Facebook, Twitter, and all of those can affect you far more than you realize. One of the worst parts about this kind of media is it makes it easy to be critical of someone. It makes it easy to, 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 uh, to attack someone without having to do it face to face. You know, it's a whole lot harder to look someone in the eye and be critical than it is to put it on a Facebook post or send a text. We all know stories of people whose lives have been irreparably damaged because of media, because of inappropriate use of media. The other thing about this kind of thing is, uh, is it makes it possible to, uh, to get things instantaneously. Consequently, we have become very, very impatient when we don't get what we want right now. Did you know there are some things in life that only come to those who wait? There are certain things in life that will only happen through the passage of time. I know, I know I've said this before and it's very silly, but did you know that it takes exactly 24 months for a kid to turn two? I mean, you can bring your baby up here and you can lay them on the altar and you can lay hands on them and you can pray for them. It's still going to take 24 months for them to turn two. You can't rush it. And that's part of the problem with media. Everything rushes, rush, rush, rush. We want it now, right now. And folks, that steals your joy. I don't even have to talk about the things that, that go on with computers and phones that you hold in your hand. Monitor your Monitor, guard your heart, guard your mind. I had a professor in college who used to say this, garbage in, garbage out. You know, if you put garbage in here, guess what will come out here? Garbage. If you want to know what's really inside of someone's heart, all you got to do is shake them up. Right? If all you're putting in is junk, when you get shuck up, it's junk that comes out. And he used to say this away, you got to stay away from that stinking thinking. It's a good way to think about it. The word says this. You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you'll be destroyed by each other. And then down to 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is, if you know them, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Watch what you put into your brain. Watch the company you hang out with. But watch what you watch. And watch how you use media. One more this morning. Check your heart. Check your heart. That really gets to the heart of it, I believe. The last passage of Scripture sums it up when it says that all the law is fulfilled with one command. You remember what it was? Love your neighbor as yourself. I don't mean to pry, but is there anyone whom you are not loving as yourself? Not too many amens. How about a couple of ouches? Are you hanging on to bitterness in your life? Criticalness, lack of forgiveness, you know, you get the point. 
If you are hanging on to any of that kind of stuff in your life, then your joy is gone. I guarantee it. Jesus said it very clearly. If you do not forgive men when they sin against you, then your Father in heaven will not forgive you. I mean, it's pretty clear. And there is nothing, there is nothing, nothing that will steal your joy faster than when your relationship with our Father in heaven is fractured. When you are not right with God, I don't care how much good stuff is poured into your life, when your relationship with him is not right, joy will never be something that you can hang on and live in, in a positive way. Galatians says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So there you have it. I know, I know, this is Christmas and we're supposed to talk about good cheer and happy words and pats on the back and figgy pudding and all that stuff. The truth is, though, the word is very clear. And our response should be like what happened when the Hebrew children had returned to Jerusalem and rebuilt the wall. Do you remember back as reported in Nehemiah? They had a celebration, a much-deserved celebration, and they asked Ezra, who was the prophet at the time, to bring out the word. And Ezra brought out the word, and, they, and he read the word to the people, he and his priests, from dawn till noon. You think our services get long sometime? From dawn till noon, they read the word. And the response of the people was rejoicing when they heard the word. And then there was weeping when they realized the conviction that came upon their hearts when they realized that they weren't living up to the standard that God had for them. They weren't living up to the standard that the word presented. You see, when we understand the word, there's joy. But when we realize how human we are and unfortunately how inadequate we are at living up to God's standard, it will hit us. When we come face to face with the truth of God's word, it reveals sin in our life. In Hebrews, it says this, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. But when we see it and experience it and soak in it, and it results in real change. I'm talking about the word. When we do that, the result, I guarantee you, is joy. Think back to the time when you really bent your knee at an altar or, or in a place of prayer and you asked Jesus to forgive your sins and, and to come into your heart. The universal thing that happened for every person was peace and joy. When you know that everything is right this way, it gives joy. And as Nehemiah reports, this day is sacred to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. How can joy be strength? Did you know that when you are joyful, I mean, when you truly have the joy of the Lord living in your heart, not the emotion of it, because emotions come and go. The joy that's a choice and an attitude. It gives you strength to stand up against anything that the world throws our, throws our way. It gives, us, it gives us strength to stand up against any attacks that the evil one sends toward us. So here's the challenge. Give yourselves the gift of joy this Christmas. You know, actively, the gift of joy is not just a gift for you, is it? It's a gift for your family. And if we're truly honest, it's a gift for everyone else we meet. Choose joy. Allow God's joy to flow in you and through you this Christmas. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for... Uh, the privilege that we have to come together and worship you. It is so good to come together with your people and to, to share these songs of joy and celebration. And I just pray that as we continue today, that you would touch our hearts, 
in our minds. And you would speak to us if there's anything inside of us that needs to, to be surrendered to you so that our joy can be restored. I pray that you would do that. Father, you are so good. And we love and we adore you today. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.